Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. It's a big day for voting rights in America. Will the Senate advance the Democrats' sweeping election overhaul bill? Probably not, but that's not stopping hundreds of so-called freedom riders from busing to D.C. to turn up the pressure. When we fight, we, we win. win! When we fight, we, we win! win. Over in Illinois, they are still cleaning up after a devastating tornado tore through the Chicago suburbs. And over in New York City, it's primary day. New Yorkers heading to the polls to pick their candidates for mayor. Local elections are actually just as important as our national elections. I think issues such as housing, our economy, and crime will uh, rank as my top um, issues of importance. We start today with the Senate vote on the For the People Act. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell's on the Hill. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memelis in Washington, D.C. We start today with the Senate vote on the For the People Act. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell is, of course, on the Hill. And NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli is in Washington, D.C., at the White House. Leanne, uh, the Dems need 60 votes to advance this bill. They won't have 10 Republican votes, but we do know now they'll have Joe Manchin. What's he saying about his decision to vote yes? They sure will have Senator Joe Manchin. That was announced <clears throat> earlier today where he put out a statement. Well, first, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer broke the news, and then Senator Manchin put out a statement talking about that he will vote on this measure that just opens the debate on voting rights legislation. He writes in part that this compromise legislation makes it easier to vote by expanding voter access through early voting and vote by mail for those who are eligible and unable to vote in person. Additionally, the bill has been modified to include voter ID requirements that aim to strengthen the security of our elections without making it harder for Americans to vote. So when Senator Manchin is talking about a compromise bill, that's part of the agreement he got with Senator Schumer that if they are able to move on to this legislation and actually begin debating it, one of the first things that would be then voted on is the compromise proposal by Senator Manchin, which was uh, something that he needed in order to support this measure, this vote today. But in reality, Allison, they are not going to get the 10 Republicans necessary in order to even opening open debate on this legislation. So while it this is just a symbolic win for Democrats, the fact that they are able to say that all 50 Democrats are united on this one specific vote, and they are much more easy, they can much more easily blame Republicans. Republicans for opposing it, Allison. All right, so Mike, as Leanne said, uh, you know, they may have gotten Manchin, uh, but they're not getting the Republicans. We know the president supports this bill, but it's not likely to pass. So what's the White House's plan? Well, the question you ask, Allison, is the question a lot of Democrats are asking. Think about it. While this big debate is yeah. happening on Capitol Hill, we didn't see the president at all in public yesterday. We only saw a brief glimpse of him today. He was meeting with the FEMA administrator to talk about summer of storms and the White House preparedness for that. And the White House was a bit defensive during today's press briefing when uh, Press Secretary Jen Psaki was posed with the words of one congressional Democrat who said, basically, where is the president out there? He needs to be stronger. Uh, Jen Psaki responding by saying these words are a fight with the wrong opponent. Here's more of Psaki on the White House's strategy around this. What the president and what the vice president will do is engage with voting rights groups, engage with legislatures who are supportive of expanding access to voting around the country. Yes, there are, even in red states, there are many Democratic legislators or legislators who want to expand that access, empower them, work with them, uh, support them in these efforts, and continue to fight to get legislation across the finish line on the federal level. 
Uh, so what the White House also says is, listen, President Biden gave a strong speech and that included uh, a big push on voting rights a few weeks ago in Tulsa. Uh, the Attorney General Merrick Garland last week announced a series of actions that the Justice Department was going to be taking without the need for legislation to try to ramp up enforcement of voter rights, voter protections. And we're going to see a symbolic gesture, at least today. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, the White House just announced, will preside over the Senate for that vote. It's not because there's a tie that she needs to break. That's usually the only time we see the vice president in the chair in the Senate. But sometimes it's just about sending a powerful message about how important this issue is to the White House. And that's what her role is going to be there today. Sending a strong message. All right, Leanne and Mike, let me ask both of you. President Biden met with Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema on infrastructure yesterday. Uh, Leanne, first to you, what's the word on the Hill about how those talks went? They say that the talks went well, um, and they are continuing to talk with White House officials today. Uh, they, Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema, they seem to be at the center of every debate these days, um, including infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they uh, continue to meet with their Republican counterparts and White House officials to try to figure out how to reach an agreement on this bipartisan infrastructure proposal. What is still perplexing this group though, is how to pay for it. We are told today that one of the things that the White House has said is unacceptable is um, some private public partnerships to fund transportation projects. And that is something that is extremely frustrating to Republicans, considering that um, they think that this is kind of an easy win. So the White House has once again taken something else off the table, making these negotiations very difficult to come to some sort of agreement, Allison. All right, so let's get the other side. Mike, what's the White House saying about that meeting? Well, it was interesting when the White House put out a statement about these two separate meetings uh, that the readout they put out of the Manchin meeting focused not on infrastructure, but on voting rights. We remember what the president did a few weeks ago. I mentioned his speech in Tulsa. He called out without mentioning their names, but we all knew who he was talking about, Senator Sinema, Senator right. Manchin, <laughs> about not necessarily supporting some of the voting rights efforts that are underway. So the fact that Manchin came out ultimately to support voting to move this process forward, the White House will point to as uh, a sign that that meeting worked. Uh, they're not saying much more about the meeting with Senator Sinema, but clearly what the White House is trying to do is, yes, they want a bipartisan deal, but if those talks end up falling through, and as Leanne lays out, there's probably reasons to believe that that might happen, they need to make sure Sinema and Manchin are on board, and that's what that meeting was all about. All right, Leanne, Mike, great to have you both together today. Thank you so much. They call themselves Freedom Riders, a group of activists pushing for civil rights in 2021, traveling by bus from Phoenix to D.C. in support of the For the People Act. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hilliard is along for the ride. Allison, now this vote is taking place in the Senate here tonight, and conversations and debates will take place over the incoming days as Senate One bill is expected to not be voted on to be allowed to be debated in the Senate. But at the same time, there's buses like this one here. We're part of a caravan. This is a bus full of activists, of faith leaders, union members, uh, particularly from Arizona and Southern California that are currently en route to Washington, D.C., where they intend to meet with lawmakers and others this upcoming Thursday. We are just passing through Atlanta right now. They'll be stopping in Greensboro, North Carolina tonight. But they're part of what essentially they're referring to themselves as the Freedom Riders of 2021. We started the morning with them in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, in their trek north. I want to let you take a listen to just uh, one individual who we talked with uh, just a bit ago. Uh, she's a member of a church in downtown Phoenix, Pilgrim Rust Baptist Church. And uh, Francine Barrow told us what led her uh, onto this bus here and why she's taking this trek across the country. Take a listen. We need that bill to pass. We need it to pass. We want voters' right for voters, for workers, for all people, black, white, purple. I have grandchildren. I have children. I want them to be able to vote in the near future and not be afraid of voting or what's going to happen if they don't get the bill passed. We want the bill passed. 
Francine is one of those bus riders from the state of Arizona, of course, as we're driving through Georgia. Those are the two states that elected Democratic senators, helped shifting the majorities in the Senate, and of course helped flick, flip electoral votes for Georgia and Arizona in favor of Democrat Joe Biden. And what we're consistently hearing from folks is a demand, a call for action. Now that Democrats have the majority in the House, in the Senate, in the White House, and you look at this for the People Act, uh, the biggest, the most major piece of voting rights legislation dating back to 1964. Uh, the type of legislation that folks want to see passed with these majorities. But you see here tonight an expectation that another hurdle is expected to be placed in the way. But that is not stopping this bus from continuing on that journey to Washington, D.C. and demanding that Democrats and Republicans continue negotiations and continue talks to find some sort of a deal that could expand some of those voting protections. It is primary day in New York City. The big race in the Big Apple who will be the next mayor. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is in Manhattan. Uh, Ron, I understand you've been talking with voters all day long. How's the turnout been there and what issues uh, matter most to voters there? What are they telling you? Well, the, the turnout's been relatively low. It's it's rainy out here, too, which isn't helping as, all, as well. And, you know, we know that That'll municipal elections are usually low turnout affairs. So. Uh, the, the candidates are making their last minute pitches, trying to get their voters out. Uh, the polls don't close until nine o'clock tonight. Uh, it's a very important election, obviously, for New York City as it emerges from this pandemic. Uh, the other big issue on the agenda for most voters is, is crime and, and public safety, uh, as well as uh, inequality and some of the uh, issues that were raised during the pandemic, the disparities between different communities in this huge city. Here's what some voters told us as we asked them what their most important issue was today. Take a listen. I think education is most important. I think the homeless and the living situations are more, more important to me. A lot of people during the pan pandemic, they lost their homes and things like that. And so for me, that's really important. What's important about this election? Education, community, and family. It's time for a change. A change to what? Change. Education, our lives, who's important, what's going on in the world. The new generation, we're not accepting what we used to accept before. So it's time for a change. So there you hear it. And uh, clearing away, as you talk to voters around town, public safety is the issue. And who's the best candidate to bring New York back uh, from this awful pandemic and, and move the city forward? Back to you, Allison. So, Ron, let's go over the candidates. And this is a pretty lopsided field. I mean, we're talking about 13 Democrats, <laughs> just two Republicans. Uh, so let's start with the Dems. Uh, I know Eric Adams is in the lead heading into today. Could you tell our viewers a little bit about him and the other Democratic contenders in this ranked choice primary? Yeah, he's leading in the polls. He is the... Uh president of Brooklyn, one of the five boroughs in New York. He's also a former state senator. Uh, he's also a former captain in the NYPD, NYPD, and he's made a lot of his campaign about public safety. He, he's a man from a neighborhood in Brooklyn who talks about how when he was young, he was arrested and beaten up by the police and, and has became a cop to try and reform the police department. One of the big issues here is public safety, and there's a group of Democrats who want to see money taken away or, or held down in the police department and diverted to other pro social programs. There's another group that wants to increase the, the number of, of police on the force. So that's one big issue. Um, another, uh, there are a number of leading candidates. Another leading one is, is, is um, Catherine Garcia, who we just met here recently. She's the former sanitation commissioner. Uh, there's um, uh, a number of candidates. Maya Wiley, who you may remember was an MSNBC commentator who had to leave the air before she um, began her campaign. And of course, Andrew Yang, the former presidential candidate, who was high up in the polls at the beginning, largely on name recognition, but he's since, he's since faded somewhat. But again, it's a wide open race. 13 candidates on the Democratic side, uh, Curtis Sliwa and Fernando Mateo on the Republican side. Um, and while Democrats have a huge advantage here, you have to remember that two of the last three elected mayors in New York City, going back to the 1990s now, were Republicans. So it's not a foregone conclusion that the Democrat who will take on the Republican in November is going to necessarily be the next mayor of New York, although the odds are certainly on that. And you mentioned ranked choice voting. It's a new system that's being tried in New York. Um, basically, it allows voters to make five choices in a, a preference of, of their candidate. So, um, so you vote for your favorite and then the, the next four. 
And it's a system that, that basically takes away the person who has the least number of votes and reapportions that person's votes in successive rounds. This could take a while. It's complicated, but it's about democracy. It's about giving voters a bigger say in what's happening, especially in, in, in elections where there's expected to be a low turnout like this one and a small plurality of voters who would select the eventual winner. Um, so stick around, stand by. It's going to take a while to see who the winner is. And again, <laughs> it's a very, very contentious election. It's a very, very active election because there's so much at stake for this city yeah. like the rest of the country post-pandemic. A contentious election, a complicated process. Ron, thank you so much. I would know we'll be checking in with you, whether it's in a matter of weeks, uh, to find out the results. Appreciate it. New York City using ranked choice voting for the very first time. So how exactly does it work? There is no one better to explain it. And we mean no one than the chart throb himself. NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki. He is, of course, at the big board. All right, Allison. Well, it's primary day in the country's biggest city, New York City. The Democratic primaries where most of the attention is overwhelmingly Democratic New York. The expectation is whoever wins this Democratic primary overwhelmingly likely to become the next mayor of New York. But, whoa, winning this primary is going to be a very complicated matter. They're doing something brand new here. It's ranked choice voting. New York City is the largest jurisdiction in the country to try this. It's very complicated, but let's try to work through how this is going to work. So you see every candidate here, what you're looking at is the final poll that was taken. This was a Marist WNBC poll. This is the Democratic field. There are 13 candidates who are going to be on the Democratic ballot. This is how they broke down in the final poll. We'll end up seeing what happens, obviously, when voters go to the poll. But let's use this to show you how ranked choice voting works. So here's all 13 of them. And let's just say, for the sake of explaining, explaining things that this is how people actually voted. Uh, that's what the returns end up looking like. 28 percent say Adams is their first choice. Garcia, uh, 19 percent say Garcia is their first choice. The way ranked choice voting works is you go and you rank my first choice, my second choice, my third choice and, and so on. So let's say these are the first choice totals just to show you how this works. The way what happens is whoever comes in last place. So in, the, in this case, it would be this candidate here, Foldenauer, would get eliminated. So Foldenauer would be eliminated. And then anybody who voted for Foldenauer, and in this poll, there aren't too many of them, but anybody who voted for Foldenauer, what they would then look at is, OK, on those ballots, those Foldenauer voters, who was the second choice? You know, maybe some of them would have picked Adams. Maybe some would pick Stringer. Some would pick McGuire, whatever it would be. They would reallocate those votes. People who voted for Foldenauer, he'd be eliminated. Their second choice would be reallocated you know, to whoever they had picked for their second choice. So those ballots, the votes would change a little bit. They'd run things all over again. And then Again, the process would repeat. Whoever's in last place, let's say it ended up being Isaiah, uh, Isaac Wright, would be eliminated. The votes would be reallocated. They'd run them again. And they would keep doing this process round after round after round until there were just two candidates left. And then they would run it one more time. And whoever had the most votes then would win. So that's the very complicated process here. That's how they get uh, a winner of this primary with more than 50 percent of the vote. The ballot folks get is going to look something like this. They're going to see all these different names. They're going to be asked. You can rank, you know, who's your first, second, third, fourth, fifth choice. It's a very complicated thing. And the other thing that complicates this even further the timetable. We're going to get some results tonight uh, on primary night. All you're really going to see tonight are a lot of the ballots, who the first choice was, not, not even for all of them, just for the votes that were cast today and for the votes that were cast early. Nothing to do with mail ballots, but you will get some of the first choice votes tonight. The mail ballots won't be due till next week. We won't really get uh, a look at all of those different rounds of allocation for another two weeks. I think it's mid-July that we're really going to get a result from this Democratic primary. It's a very important race. The winner of this Democratic primary overwhelmingly likely to be the next mayor of New York. But just because tonight is primary night doesn't mean we're going to know who that winner is tonight. We're probably not going to know that until mid-July. And again, as I say, New York City, eight and a half million people, never has a jurisdiction this large tried something like this before. So we're all in for potentially some surprises here. How is this going to work? About to find out. 
it is one of my favorite times of day when we hand over the show to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce, who has the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Simone, what do you have for us today? Hey, Allison, I want to know who out there has been getting their prime day on. We're going to start with some early prime day numbers. So get this during the first 24 hours of Amazon's prime day event, sales are set to blow past five point six billion dollars billion with a B. That's according to Adobe Analytics. That's more than the five point one billion dollars online shoppers spent on Thanksgiving Day last year crazy numbers there. All right, now shifting to the Olympics. I know that yesterday we told you that there would most likely be spectators in the stadiums at the Olympics, but here's the thing. It's still possible that there won't be any spectators allowed at all. And that's because the president of the Tokyo Olympics organizing committee is saying in an exclusive interview with NBC News that they could bring down the number of spectators or ban them all together if cases surge. Now she added games and events could be canceled if athletes themselves start testing positive for COVID. And in the Philippines, President Rodrigo Duterte is threatening to arrest Filipinos who refuse to get the COVID-19 vaccine, saying, quote, if you will not agree to be vaccinated, leave the Philippines. Now we should note though, there is no law in the Philippines criminalizing vaccine refusal. And astronauts who want to keep their spacesuits fresh in outer space, can you blame them? Well, look no further. Tide is partnering with NASA to create a fully degradable detergent that cleans without wasting water. They'll be testing the products, including a Tide to go pen over the next decade at the International Space Station and on missions to the moon and Mars. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those products make it Earth side too. And finally, Bumble, the online dating app, is giving all its employees a whole week off in order to avoid burnout. Its 750 employees will start working again on June 28th after this little break. Spokesperson saying, we wanted to give our global teams a paid week off to rest and refresh after what's been an incredibly challenging time for everyone. Did I did I get that story right, Allison? Are they actually giving employees a week off for no reason other than just rest? And I'm giving them two thumbs up. As a person who just came back from a week of vacation, I can tell you, and I'm sure you agree, I didn't realize how, maybe I did realize how burnt out I was. I didn't realize how burnt out I was, though, fully until I took a vacation and came back feeling like myself again. Props to any company uh, that, that's helping people get past this past year because, man, it's been rough. Seriously, you go, Bumble. Yeah, go, Bumble. I'm into it. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> More than 30 million Americans under a severe storm watch today as thunderstorms and tornadoes rip across the Northeast. In Chicago, residents are picking up from a weekend tornado that damaged more than 100 homes, wiped out power and hurt several people. NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has more from Naperville, Illinois. Files and the National Weather Service was out here assessing the damage, really focusing in on areas that were hardest hit. So certainly the house behind me here that's just obliterated was a focus point for them. Uh, and they have concluded that it was an EF3 tornado that ripped through this community. So we're talking about up to 140 mile per hour winds. We know that out of the more than 200 structures that were damaged, 19 in this community here are uninhabitable. And that one house that was leveled had two people inside. Those folks are at the hospital still, but we understand that their condition is improving. Uh, shortly after this tornado ripped through town, uh, the community came together. The cleanup effort was underway. We saw people coming to help neighbors that they didn't even know, try and sift through uh, the debris that the tornado had left behind, trying to find those personal items that they may be able to salvage. I want you to listen to what one guy had to say about why he decided to come out and help. So why would you come out here? Just to help out. You know, if, if this was my house, you know, I wish the community would come together and help me. So just doing my part. Now, power has been restored to about 98 percent of customers in this community with just about a thousand people waiting to have their energy turned back on. The power company tells us that something that they're working on, they're hoping to restore power to these folks by the end of the day. Allison. 
NFL history happening off the field. Raiders defensive end Carl Nassib announcing on social media that he's gay, making the first active NFL player to come out. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has reaction to Nassib's historic announcement. I just want to take a quick moment to say that I'm gay. After more than 100 seasons, this fall could bring a new first for the NFL, with defensive end Carl Nassib becoming the league's first openly gay active player. I'm really not doing this for attention. Um, I just think that representation and visibility are so important. Nassib posting, I feel especially thankful to have had so much support when many who came before me and many even now do not. At six foot seven and 280 pounds, Nassib makes an impact on the field. That's an interception by Nassib. Now entering his sixth season, his second year with the Raiders, he caught people's eye off the field as well in HBO's Hard Knocks when he shared his financial knowledge with players in this colorful tutorial. Financial advisors are everywhere, okay? Don't f- take your money. In his post Monday, Nassib pledged $100,000 to the Trevor Project, a nonprofit that focuses on suicide prevention and crisis intervention for LGBTQ youth, a group more than four times as likely as their peers to attempt suicide. CEO Amit Paley says announcements like Nassib's, especially in sports, can make a big difference. Representation matters. And when young people look up and see people who are like them, it sends a message that they can succeed. Just seven years ago, Michael Sam became the first openly gay player drafted to the NFL, but he never played a regular season game. The same year, the NBA's Jason Collins became the second openly gay athlete to play in a major professional sports league in the U.S. And two years ago, soccer superstar Megan Rapinoe became the first open lesbian to be part of Sports Illustrated's famed swimsuit issue. On Thursday, messages of support from Nassib's alma mater to rival teams and the league itself, which said the NFL is proud of you. This is the NFL is standing behind him. It's such a powerful message for, you know, other athletes who are contemplating coming out or, or thought that they'd wait until their playing careers are done. A sentiment expressed by Nassib during his own coming out. I actually hope that like one day videos like this and the whole coming out process are just not necessary. New York Times NFL reporter Ken Belson joining me now. Ken, great to have you back on the show. Uh, Nassib says he agonized over this moment for the last 15 years. Look, I've never played in the NFL, but I have covered it. And it has long been considered a culture that does not make players feel comfortable coming out. Let's talk about that culture. And, and do you think this is the start of some real change here? Well, you're right. Uh, the NFL is all about conformity, um, following orders, uh, taking direction from coaches, uh, not uh, expressing yourself too much outside of uh, certain boundaries. And obviously, personal preferences uh, tend to be kind of muted uh, in the league. And so this is why you, it's taken 101 years to get to this point. Um, so it could be uh, a new phase. Uh, we've, we've seen the NFL in the last few years take steps or try to take steps to have a more inclusive culture. There are now several women coaches. Uh, they are still trying and somewhat struggling to get people of color in high uh, executive positions like general managers and coaches. Uh, but they are pushing. And in this case, uh, this is a, a, a groundbreaking move. Yeah, I think we can all agree it's certainly a step in the right direction and a long overdue one. And it looks like it's being well received, right? The Raiders, the league coming out supporting Nassib. Who else is backing him? And on the flip side, I have not seen, but have you seen any negative reaction today? Anyone anyone giving him a hard time about it? Uh, I haven't seen any negative reaction, and it is telling that the NFL, the NFLPA, the Players Union uh, have come out strongly last night. Uh, the Raiders, obviously, uh, his team and some of his teammates. Um, you know, go back seven years when Michael Sam declared uh, or was drafted and uh, acknowledged that he was gay. Uh, there were only former NFL players who came to his defense. Uh, no, uh, uh, very few players who were his teammates then uh, or potential teammates then. So the yeah. culture has shifted, and I think that's that's an improvement. Uh, NASA also made a donation to the Trevor Project, which provides crisis and suicide prevention services for LGBTQ plus youth. We have seen uh, the anti-trans sports bills that are taking hold in several states this spring and summer. Uh, what do you make of his timing here? Well, it's good timing, not just because it's Pride Month, but because states are now um, uh, looking for litigation uh, against bullying against um 
or uh, gays and anybody uh, of different persuasions. And so I think this is a good moment uh, to crystallize around uh, these le these legislative moves. Um, the other thing, too, and it's worth noting, this happened in June. This is um, the slowest part of the calendar when a lot of players are not here. So he was able to get a lot of attention, not when games were being played and his message might have been lost. And it also didn't put his teammates on the spot uh, because they're not uh, in the locker room right now. So it allowed his message to get out loud and clear without pressuring other players. Well, I'm looking forward to the NFL as I do every year. And Ken, hopefully uh, we'll see this having a real positive impact when the season gets started again. Thank you uh, so much for being on with us to talk about this. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks. It is time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. Today, we are talking work attire for a lot of people. It is time to ditch the sweatpants and start putting on real shoes again. So what the heck do you wear back at the office after over a year at home? Sarah LaFleur, founder and CEO of MM LaFleur, a women's workwear company, is here to help us out. And we are so grateful for you, Sarah. Uh, women are rewriting the rules of workwear post-pandemic. I mean, you may not be able to bring the sweats to work, but a lot of us we don't want to do the stilettos and the skirts anymore either. Uh, so what do we do here? What is appropriate? And, and please, you got to help me here. What is a jardigan? <laughs> a jardigan is our take on the jacket plus cardigan. It is the most comfortable jacket okay. you will ever get your hands on. So we highly recommend it. Um, but Allison, I think you were asking all the right questions. You know, when we, we polled our customers, over 90% of women said that they were feeling anxious about returning to work. Um, and actually 73% of our customers said that they were going to be dressing differently when, when, when they went back to the workplace, uh, the majority of them this fall. And so we have been helping our customers really think about what is that new go-to uh, look. In some ways, it's gotten even murkier, this dress code, and a lot of women are saying, what the hell do I wear? Um, we are proposing a look for a lot of our women, which we like to call power casual. Uh, if you have business formal, considering you know that is the most formal tier of workwear, below that you have business casual, we propose power casual as the one level below that, where you are definitely still put together and looking your best, but also bringing so much of the comfort that we, we love about our sweatpants, about our leggings, into our work attire. So uh, that is what we're talking to our customers about. You're speaking my my language. This is totally my vibe. I love the power casual. Let me ask you this, though, Sarah. This was a tough year for a lot of working women, right? A lot of them uh, may not have a ton of money after a, a year during the pandemic to spend on new work clothes. So if you are on a budget, if money is tight, what are a few key pieces that you should maybe think about adding to your closet right now? And is there one or two things that you say, skip this, you won't need it anymore? You know, so we're really focused on talking to women about wearing what makes them feel comfortable. Um, over a quarter of women are saying that they have actually gained weight or lost weight during the pandemic. Um, I had a baby. I'm definitely one of them. And rather than trying to squeeze yourself into clothes that may be too small or too big for you, bear, wear the thing that makes you feel most comfortable. There will be plenty of fashion moments later. But for now, let's just make sure that we can feel ourselves, that we're minimizing our anxiety when we go back to the workforce. So, you know, those elastic waistbands that we got so used to, guess what? There are now really beautiful, comfortable looking, uh, comfortable pants that come with those elastic waistbands. Um, for us, the Colby joggers has, have been our best sellers and they're definitely polished enough to wear to the office, but they still have the, that elastic waistband. So you won't feel uh, nauseous on your first day back at work. Um, the Jardigan very much in that same, vein. it has stretch. So that's the thing that you want to really be thinking about your first day at work, back in the office, I should say. You're making me feel, yeah, you're making me feel so much better because literally today before I went on air, I tried on a new belt that I just bought that I couldn't get around my waist. And I looked at it and I said, this is going back. We're just not doing belts right now. Like, this is just not the time to be trying to put something around the waist. Uh, maybe later. Just maybe exactly. later. I'll think about it then. Let me yes, ask you later. <laughs> right attitude. Do the thing that makes right now. We have we have no other choice. All right, let me ask you about women who might not be going back to work. Maybe they're still going to be working from home and doing a lot of Zooms and virtual meetings indefinitely. Anything they should do or just keep in mind to make sure that they're not looking like they're slouching at home when some of their colleagues may be going back to work and dressing a little bit more for the office. 
Yeah, you know, I think this is going to be something that's going to be true for a lot of workers, not just the people who are full-time work from home. Uh, this hybrid dressing, I think, is very much going to be the norm now. So uh, what I really recommend my customers is basically wear a knit top and some comfortable, uh, you know, I, I'm wearing what I call the, uh, the Hockley pants. It's the most comfortable, proper-looking pants out there with another uh, stretchy waistband. And then when you have a meeting or you have something a little bit more proper coming up, just throw on a jacket. And then when the kids run back home or you're going out to drinks with your girlfriends, hopefully just take the jacket off. And hopefully it's just that one thing that you layer on and off that signals what kind of moment that you're, moment you're in. Um, so I think investment in a proper jacket or just, you know, finding one of the jackets that you, you cast away for the past 16 months, it's time to bring those back out. Yeah. Dust that one off. Uh, Sarah, you founded M.M. LaFleur back in 2013. I profiled you guys uh, back in the day as a hot new startup in New York City. Tell us about your business and how the pandemic has changed it. I mean, just looking at the images of the clothing that you're selling now, I remember it was all about, you know, dresses and more of a, a, a not so much a power casual. I love the new look that you're doing with the sneakers, with the cool pants. It's just really an interesting shift. How has your business had to change over the last year? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was really tough the first few months. I mean, we, you know, really fundamentally, I think there was this question of what does workwear even mean in the new world? Um, but I think it yeah. turns out, you know, the formality you're in, the anxiety that a lot of women carry about what to wear to work, it still exists. Um, there's a stat that says women on average spend two extra weeks versus men getting ready for work every morning. And that's actually oh, true man. regardless work in a more business formal environment or in a power casual environment that we just talked about. Um, our business goal really from day one is to make it as easy as possible for women to get dressed and to get out of the, the their homes in the morning. So that goal has never changed, but our, our attire has, our merchandise has, and we've been seeing the casualization of the workplace since, uh, you know, I would say as early as 2016, 2017. And so really this trend has continued and COVID has only accelerated it. Well, Sarah, I have to thank you because after I profiled you guys back then, I bought a whole bunch of M.M. LaFleur and I have dresses that I still wear on interview days on uh, if I have to go to a funeral. I have pieces that I bought from you that are absolute essentials. And I'm going to tap into this new power casual because I got to say the sneakers and the pants. I think I can really ease into this. This seems like the new way forward. I love that. Thank you so much, Allison. And congratulations on all your success. And thank you so much for having me back at OVC. Hey, to you guys, too. Congrats on navigating the pandemic. It has been a tough year for a lot of people, especially for working women and female CEOs. So congrats to you guys on weathering the storm. Much success ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Traffic, transit delays. Welcome back to the work commute, people. It is coming. NBCNews.com senior business reporter Ben Popkin writing that workers called back to their office are facing new hurdles as they contend with higher costs, less public transit and new anxieties. Ben joins me live now. Uh, ben, thanks. Uh, we're all nervous after after hearing that headline. But I, I think it's one thing most workers agree on. Right. Nobody misses their commute. They're worried that it's going to be worse uh, when they go back. You've taken a hard look at this. Uh, what are we up against when we go back to the office? Well, riders showing up to catch the train or bus at their old usual time might be left waiting on the platform. Uh, these transit lines have had to cut service, eliminate lines as ridership and revenues plummeted. That makes it harder to plan your schedule to get to work. There's also some increased costs. Folks who are not taking public transit, either returning to the car or switching to, to driving, uh, they have to deal with rising costs and the, and the cost of parking. And people are just anxious. I mean, we've spent over 15 months you know, in the safety bubble of our homes where we can control all our risk factors. Every step outside that increases anxiety, uh, understandably. Uh, public transit is basically defined by a lack of social distance and you're in an enclosed space. That's just what we spent all this time avoiding. And writers also say they're concerned about rising crime and feel like they're noticing more uh, drug use around the stations as well. 
Yeah, I heard a lot of reports of that as well. Ben, I'm someone who used to love uh, riding the crowded New York City subway, but COVID certainly changes your perspective a little bit. Uh, you also write that recalling workers presents unexpected challenges and can create something of a standoff between management and employees. What are some of the big issues you're seeing there? Well, one of the major issues is child care. Workers are having very real child care issues. They can't get daycare. And they, even if they can, it might not open in time for them to get to work at their usual time. So uh, that's one of the big conversations that's happening between workers and management. And then we have some workers, uh, we, we knew this would happen, haven't or say they won't get vaccinated. And employers are having to decide on how to handle those individuals on a case-by-case basis. Uh, and then you have workers who may not ever feel safe uh, or, or they feel like their productivity actually increased during the pandemic. And they feel like maybe that shows the office is an outdated concept for them. And they're going to push for permanent remote options, either with that company or elsewhere. Over a third of workers have said that they will start looking for new jobs if they're forced to return to the office. And that's something that employers are going to have to take seriously when so many are having trouble hiring and retaining in the first place. Yeah, it's a new reality of our new normal. Ben, always great to have you on. Appreciate it. Chilling new video offering another up-close look at the January 6th Capitol riots. The Justice Department releasing three new clips from that day. This one showing a mob breaching police lines on the east side of the Capitol. Uh, among them, Charles Donahoe, the man accused of leading the conspiracy group The Proud Boys in the insurrection. Scott McFarland is an investigative reporter with our NBC affiliate WRC in Washington. He joins me now. Uh, Scott, we're, we're really thrilled to have you on this story today. Thank you so much. Uh, so the DOJ issuing this footage as evidence in their case against Donahoe. What are prosecutors charging him with and how does this video help their case? Yeah, good afternoon. He faces among the most serious charges. But what the video makes clear is this was a multi front war January 6th. The footage released in Donahoe's case gives us our most vivid look at the east front of that war the east side of the Capitol. As you see the video, be aware this is footage curated by the Justice Department. They're the ones who released this video. You'll see when the video uh, rolls that there was some graphics added, some slow-mo added, all of that from the U.S. Justice Department. Donahoe has pleaded not guilty in his case, but the body camera footage and the new footage in his case released by the feds gives us an illustration of how outnumbered the police were that day by scales of magnitude. Donahoe is an accused proud boy facing among the most serious charges, including conspiracy, the feds say he was part of stealing a riot shield and using that riot shield to breach the police line, then breach the Capitol. Again, he's pleaded not guilty, but we're seeking out these video exhibits, going to court to get them because prosecutors say they're important in showing the, the ferociousness of what happened that day and why judges mm -hmm. should be holding some of these defendants in pretrial detention. Scott, you're also reporting there's a growing number of cases in which Speaker Pelosi was specifically targeted and threatened. Could you tell us more about those? Violent threats and vulgar threats. A series of defendants over the last few mm -hmm. days have been accused of not only entering her suite and putting their feet up on her desk or looking at her computers, but making vulgar threats to her well-being, to her safety. Really, misogyny is so at the root of so many of these cases. We see defendants with backstories, criminal histories of beating up women, knocking them unconscious, cursing at them. That's a pattern. It's revealing itself over the past few days. And a few moments ago, one of those defendants, Brian Mock of Minnesota, is held in jail pending trial. The feds say he threatened a witness, his ex-girlfriend, from turning him in. You're also reporting that capital security funds are dwindling and a $2 billion bill to help Capitol Police secure the area stalled. What are police telling you about their concerns here about this funding shortage? What does it mean for them? I just spoke with the head of the Capitol Police Union who says he's got a lot of heartburn about this funding. Two billion dollars approved here in the yeah. House a few weeks ago, but crickets in the U.S. Senate. The Capitol Police are operating with 300 fewer officers than they're supposed to have, than authorized, and they have a retirement bubble coming. That emergency funding has money to recruit and retain officers, which is a big problem right now. Scott, pleasure to have you on today. Thanks so much for sharing uh, your reporting for us uh, and this new look uh, at what happened on January 6th. We really appreciate it.
progressive senator from Rhode Island defending his membership at a private beach club that's allegedly all white. Sheldon Whitehouse's family belongs to Newport's exclusive Bailey's Beach Club. The senator saying the club is working on improving diversity. I think that's pretty fair. NBC News Capitol Hill producer Julie Serkin joins me now. Julie, Senator Whitehouse in some hot water over the last few days since Go Local Providence confronted him about Bailey's Beach Club. Uh, we know Whitehouse has a history of speaking out against systemic racism. So what else is he saying about this beach club situation? Yeah, hey, Allison, that's right. Sheldon Whitehouse, one of the more progressive voices here in the Senate. Uh, but on Friday, when the Go Local Providence re a reporter confronted him about his membership in this club, which, by the way, he called a tradition there on Newport Beach, uh, he said that he actually didn't deny the fact that it was an all-white club, which turned some heads and raised some eyebrows. We don't know that that's the case, of course. There's nothing to suggest factually that they don't admit non-white members. Uh, but Senator Sheldon Whitehouse hasn't said much about this, but in fact, his Spokesperson, when we reached out on Monday, provided NBC News with a comment saying, quote, the club has had and has members of color, adding that White House has, quote, dedicated his entire career to promoting equity and protecting civil rights, as his record shows. Now, we tried to chase him around on this yesterday. He wouldn't stop and talk to cameras. But this morning, we actually tried in asking him this again. And take a listen to what he said or didn't say. Senator, Senator, can we ask you about this club in Rhode Island real quick? I think that's uh, been <laughs> talked about plenty. So as you can see, my colleague Leanne there, who also covers Capitol Hill, yeah. trying to press him on this issue. He, he <laughs> said that he already talked about it uh, quite a lot. In fact, we haven't heard from him since Friday, Allison. Yeah, you know when you're running down the hall after them and they're not turning around, they're not going to give you uh, all that much there. But props to Leanne for trying. We appreciate her. Uh, I have to ask, uh, Go Local Providence says they have brought up this club before and that White House promised to quit when he ran for Senate in 2006. So, so what's the deal? Do we have a full understanding of what's going on? Yeah, so Go Local, Go Local Providence, excuse me, has been going after this since Senator Sheldon Whitehouse ran for Senate in 2006, almost 15 years ago. And they've been asking him consistently about his membership here. Back in 2017, just a couple of years ago, of course, Senator Whitehouse, as you noted at the top there, always speaking for racial justice and equality. He actually said that he sold all, or he gave all of his shares, excuse me, to his wife. He transferred them to his wife, Sandra, uh, though we don't know if he He's still a member at this club. He won't exactly say on Friday when asked by Go Local Providence again, multiple times after the first time they confronted him over this, he didn't answer. He simply said this was a long tradition on Newport Beach. This club has been around for a long time. Uh, so we don't know his status right now in this club, but he did say he transferred all of his shares. And in 2017, he said he wants the club uh, to work on their diversity and he will be handling that matter in private, he said. So, Julie, tell us a little bit more about Bailey's, if you will. I know it's been around for over 100 years. Uh, what are they saying about their membership? And are they addressing the allegations that they only let white members in? Yeah, so unfortunately, Allison, the club is as exclusive as its public websites and Facebooks and contact pages, if you will. We haven't been able to get in touch with them. They're formerly known as the Sprouting Rock Beach Association. They have this website that has a members-only login portal. We saw a number on there, and we called them, and they didn't pick up. And we've seen in other outlets, they've kind of issued a no comment or hung up the phone on reporters. So it's really hard for us to get a, gr a clear answer on what their demographics are. They've been around for over 100 years, since the late 1890s. They're membership included the Vanderbilt and the Astors. So this club is pretty exclusive with Cabanas running $50,000. Allison. All right, Julie, you know what I think this means? I think you need to get in the car. I need, think you need to swing up to New York. I think you need to pick me up. And I think we need to go check this one out for ourselves. I think we have to do it. It's our due diligence as reporters, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see if NBC will swing for a $50,000 cabana so we can go undercover and, and get the real scoop here. Julie, thank you for your reporting today. Thank you. One Olympic athlete making waves before the Summer Games in Tokyo, weightlifter Laurel Hubbard of New Zealand, is about to become the first transgender Olympian. Sky News correspondent Enda Brady has her story. Come on. Laurel Hubbard will go to the Olympics carrying so much more than a weight of expectation. 
Her very presence at the Games is likely to make her a flashpoint in a debate that has become sport's most emotive, sensitive and complex issue. We do know that there are many questions about fairness of transgender athletes competing in the Olympic Games, but I would like to take this opportunity to remind us all that Laurel has met all of the required criteria. She is a very dedicated and resilient athlete. Hubbard lived for 35 years as a male and did not compete in international weightlifting. She transitioned in 2012 and has since won several medals and meets all of the IOC's requirements. Some of her rivals say she will have an unfair advantage in terms of physiology and strength, with Belgium's Anna van Bellingen claiming her presence would be like a bad joke for other competitors. Even if Laurel Hubbard doesn't win a medal, they will have already taken the slot of a woman who would have got to the Olympics, a woman who has trained all of her life to get to the Olympics. So this idea that a trans inclusion policy is progressive and that it's inclusive is wrong. It's actually an exclusionary policy. But what does the science say? Biological males have significant performance advantages over biological females by virtue of their exposure to testosterone and other hormones during development. Does lowering or suppressing testosterone for 12 months or longer remove typically male advantages? And the answer from more than a dozen studies is a pretty emphatic no. World Rugby decided to ban transgender women at international level, saying that it couldn't assure safety and fairness for women competing against trans women in contact rugby. Laurel Hubbard says she is grateful and humbled to have been selected for the Games, where she will undoubtedly make history and headlines, whatever the outcome of her event. Enda Brady, Sky News. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.